Hello everyone, welcome back again. We're going to talk about books again. Um, as I promised, we're going to be talking about The Age of Ra. Um, this one is... It wasn't bad. It wasn't great. I picked it up mostly because I saw... It was part of a series about the gods. Um, there's also stuff like Age of Zeus and Age of Odin which is the one I really wanted, which we'll be getting to, eventually. But this was the first one, so I thought I'd give it a try first. And being unfamiliar with Egyptian mythology didn't help. I know the big ones. I know their names. I kind of know what they do and what they stand for, but I'm very unfamiliar with the Egyptian, ancient Egyptian mythology. Um, but okay, so what it's about. Um, basic basically what it's about is in this in the book I'm assuming in the series it is assumed to be true that every single god goddess mythological figure ever conceived actually exists and they are at war with each other this book takes place in the aftermath of what would have happened if the Egyptian gods had won this conf great conflict and what they ended up doing is dividing the earth to different amongst different territories that all worship different main gods. And like this is the Anubis area, and this is the Osiris area, and so on. And war, because gods don't get along. At all. Ooh, that's your question. Um So with that set up, um we have our main character, Mr. Westwinter, David Westwinter, who is a military man, part of the British military, which is part of Osiris's territory, on a uh, super secret mission that goes horribly wrong, only survivor, which is always great, and he finds himself eventually in Freegypt, what was once Egypt and the only place not controlled by the gods. There he meets up with a freedom fighter by the name of the Lightbringer, who fights for the rights of humanity against those of the, the uh, uncaring powers of the gods. And things go bananas from there. But that's our setup. So, major topics and ideas in this book. Um, Basically that struggle between man and god, and how the gods can but shouldn't control everything humans do, or how we're tied, it's... There was a point where Ra, the, the patriarch of the Egyptian gods, the best god, because he's the smartest one, and the... well, not the smartest one. I just, I just praise son, praise son. Um, he brings up that the humans are nothing without the gods because the gods are all powerful and they give them direction but the reverse is also true without the belief from humanity the gods are nothing they get they their power from humans and so that idea I think is a very central one to the book where it doesn't matter what gods we believe in, they're there because we believe they are there. And without that belief, they're nothing. That's what happened. happens with uh, all these old beliefs. The Roman gods, the uh, Scandinavian, Norse mythologies, stuff like that. It just, we stop believing it, so they go away, um, only to be stories. But I, that was probably the, the best aspect, was that kind of relationship between humans and the gods. And again, I'm assuming it's a running theme in this series, because I told you this part one in a loosely connected series. Um, another interesting idea is that of the Kingdom of the Dead. Uh, Mr. God of the Dead doesn't really care for any of the other gods, doesn't like, doesn't hate them, because he knows that there, he has this idea that eventually he's going to be the only god that matters. Eventually all the humans will die, 
and the only ones that he'll be the last god standing because he will still have the legions of the dead to worship him and believe in him in his domain that's kind of scary and kind of a good point if uh, again if we're assuming that the gods are sustained by the belief of humans if there are no humans left to believe in any of the gods except for those who are under the th who live in the domain of the dead, the underworld, and they automatically are worshippers of the god of the dead, he'll still be around forever because the dead will always be there. I just like the idea. I mean, it's kind of a twist on, well not really a twist, but kind of a an interesting way of looking at the dead in uh, terms of myth and the afterlife that I had never really considered before, I guess. I, again, I'm unfamiliar with Egyptian mythology, so if that's actually a thing already, I didn't know. Um, but anyways, overall, not a bad book, and those are the two strongest ideas Excuse me, I think it had. So, other than that, it's, um, again, I, I won't say it's bad, I did enjoy reading it, but there were just parts, like, and, and it's not a huge thing because it happens, but there is a very dominant male cast. Because, but it's because it focuses on bonds between brothers, between fathers and sons, and so on, and it doesn't focus so much on the roles women play. It's, and that, that's not a big deal. That's, that's what happens in fiction. If you're going to focus on a story between brothers, you're going to be talking about a lot of dudes. If you have a story about sisters, you're going to have a lot of chicks. It's just how it works. But the few women there are could be have been a bit, bit better portrayed and written. I mean, the one main woman is, for the most part, kind of seen portrayed as a challenge and a, uh, a prize for the main character. If he can successfully just talk to her and win her over, and eh, I didn't really like, care for that so much. That's not my thing. Mm. But yeah. That was, yeah, not a, again, not a bad book. Age of Raw. I'd recommend it. More or less. I think we like Age of Odin more. Again, I know a bit more about North mythology. But, anyways, uh, thank you for joining me this time. And next time, we will be discussing James and the Giant Peach. See you then.